Welcome, this is an introduction to energy wave theory, or EWT. Now it starts with a review of history, the simplicity of molecules and atoms. But it didn't always start that way, so just a quick review of that history. What mankind once thought was complex was eventually simplified. So let's go back. You know, many, many years ago, the early Greeks, right? they believed that all the matter was created from four elements. Now, by the 1800s, it was recognized that dozens of elements created matter, and eventually hundreds would be developed. And in 1869, the first periodic table was established, and it began to show a pattern you know, where elements are based on the number of protons, even though the proton would be discovered many years later. But the important thing about the periodic table of elements as it exists now is that it's organized based on proton count. So now we know that all of matter is simplified right, to molecules, and those molecules are made of atoms. And atoms are made of three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. But the key thing here to remember is that it's the proton that determines the type of element. All right, now let's move to the complexity of, of particles. Right? So matter was simplified to be atoms, which are simply based on number of protons. But as you smash atoms together, the particles become more complex. And since particle accelerators you know, were, were created, hundreds of these subatomic particles have been found. They've been grouped together into 17 elementary particles, and it's a table referred to as the standard model as you can see on the right. Now, the standard model is often referred to as the most successful particle theory to date. But at the same time, there are some issues that the standard model cannot explain, you know, such as gravity or dark matter or dark energy. But over time, as the standard model was being developed, there was also things that it was not able to predict and it had to be corrected one of which is listed here, and this is important because we're going to come back to the neutrino. The standard model originally predicted the neutrino to be massless. And not only does a neutrino have mass, as it's been discovered, but strangely it becomes larger into two other types as it travels, for example, from the sun to earth. And the question of where does that mass come from? But there are also issues with the standard model that are ignored, right? The standard model is supposed to be elementary particles. So neutrinos and electrons and quarks, for example, are elementary particles. They cannot be subdivided. But if they're truly elementary, then why have experiments found things such as this, right? During high energy collisions of elementary electrons, quarks have been spotted. And you can see the reference down in the URL below. Not only quarks produce, but also neutrinos have been witnessed from these collisions of electrons. Again, these are supposed to be <laughs> elementary particles, so how are quarks and neutrinos produced from electrons? And this is something more obvious, it's been known for a while, which is when a neutron decays, and a neutron is supposed to be made of three elementary quarks, somehow an electron and an antineutrino are ejected. And in the very similar process, a proton decaying, which a proton is also made of three elementary quarks, a positron, and a neutrino are ejected. Where do those come from, and how is it explained? So those are the questions. Why? I think there's still a bunch of things that are missing in the standard model. So we need to explore that further. And that's what leads to a new simple model proposed for subatomic particles. And the theory, EWT, or energy wave theory, originates from concepts from Dr. Milo Wolf and Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Lafreniere, who both propose independently particles or standing waves of energy. You can see example illustration from Lafreniere on the bottom right. And the standing waves are now circled there. So you can see there's a definition between a standing wave and it, when it converts to be traveling waves. 
Come back to that. So a hypothesis was formed here. Right? Could all particles be a result of different standing wave combinations and energy values? Such as if that was the electron, what if particles collided, merged, and their standing wave structure changed? Would the energy change, and then would it be considered a different particle? That was the hypothesis. And so the math around the theory started with the assumption that particles are standing longitudinal waves of energy coming from Wolf's work and Lafreniere's work, and that photons are also waves of energy, but they're traveling transverse waves. And today these are two very different types of energies, but it was brought together in one. In fact, the former two equations were derived from this, from an energy wave equation that has the following wave has an amplitude, a speed, there's a wavelength between waves, uh, and flowing in a density. And then you can measure that volume, and that volume uh, determines the energy that you're measuring. Now the wavelength here would be a wavelength for a longitudinal uh, waves as opposed to the photon with transverse. So this was taken as the starting point for the math. And a couple more assumptions were made. Right? That there was an elementary particle responsible for all other particles. Why this assumption? Because we already see it in nature. It already happened with all the matter and molecules uh, with atoms. So based on that assumption, right, assuming that there was a combination of these particles, uh, a letter was given to it, much like how uh, the proton count uh, in atoms was given the letter Z. There was a variable called K that was given to this, but essentially the way that it works is if um, these elementary particles uh, combine at a core, and then there's an increase in standing wave amplitude and wavelength, and also the, thus the volume that's being measured. And these assumptions were then plotted out where the particle count was taken to the fifth power because of that, because it affects amplitude and wavelength and volume in three dimensions. And so it was given a uh, also a starting point, right, which is our, what is the particle count of one, and it was taken to be the neutrino because it's the smallest known particle that's out there. And interestingly enough, if you plot out the particle energies, you get a linear line like this. The bottom axis there is a particle count number going from one to 117, and one is the neutrino, and 117 is the Higgs boson, and everything in between falls neatly onto a line. And if that wasn't a coincidence itself, you have to remember something that looks like this. this it's identical to atomic elements. And this is the mass, atomic mass versus the energy. Uh, the number is on the horizontal axis, and the energy is on the vertical axis, energy or mass. This is how the periodic table was essentially established. You could predict elements that were missing simply based on something appearing in this line. For example, if number 60 wasn't already discovered, you know exactly what the mass would, would be and you know where to look. And so that's what I think is one coincidence between the particles and uh, subatomic, um, sorry, uh, atomic elements. But there was more. So it started to group all of this into a table, and since atomic elements were also linearized, put it into a periodic table called the periodic table of uh, particles. And you can see it ranging from the neutrino, which takes the place in spot number one, which would be equivalent of hydrogen, all the way up to nearly the end of the table is the Higgs. And if that wasn't enough, you can see some of the squares that are highlighted there, the ones in red. Let me explain that on the next slide. So not only was it a coincidence that they're linearized, but here's uh, the similarities between atomic elements and subatomic particles. The leptons, and leptons are the electron family and the neutrino family, they were found at particle counts of 8, 20, 28, 50. Right, those are magic numbers that are found in atomic elements. 
and leptons are more stable of the particles. And the reason why magic numbers uh, appear in atopic elements is because that's the more stable configuration of atoms. The Higgs boson falls nearly at the end of the periodic table. And what's also interesting is that the slopes are nearly the same, roughly about 2.4x uh, and 2.6x for, for the other. So there's a lot of similarities you know, between these. So, our, so what does that really mean? If we were to digest that data and go, okay, what, what does this mean? Why is a neutrino at particle count one? Well, it'd be similar to hydrogen, right? So imagine that the neutrino is the elementary particle, and at low levels in nature, oscillation occurs. Right? This is how a neutrino could form the muon neutrino or the tau neutrino as the energy, as they spit out of the sun, the solar neutrinos arrive at Earth, they have enough energy to be able to merge, combine, and create new particles. But higher energies than just neutrinos being spit from the sun are required, right, to be able to get to even more particles. And that's what occurs in particle accelerators such as CERN. So now we can find even more particles. And we will continue to find more particles as the energy levels become higher and higher in accelerators. But the problem is that they're not geometrically stable. Particles decay, and they decay very quickly in accelerators. And the very typical arrangements that they're decaying to, other than quarks, are leptons. And I believe that they occur because they're found at magic numbers. And will likely, if we could ever get to the level of detail of finding what these particles are arranged like, I think they're going to look something like this. And these are the magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, that are also found in, in atoms. So there's some tetrahedral patterns that are shown here, and that might explain the connection now as we go from particles to molecules, because nature always repeats itself. So imagine something that looks like this. On the previous slide, the electron had a particle count of 10. That happens to be a three-level tetrahedron, which should be quite stable. Now, elsewhere in energy wave theory uh, works, which uh, is not discussed here, but you're welcome to take a look at the URL below uh, for more information, the proton can be modeled and its decay properly explained uh, as a combination of electrons in a two-level uh, tetrahedron. Again, for more information, uh, go to that link. But if we expand on this, you can see how nature builds on itself and protons as that uh, count, that proton count in that forms atomic elements, atomic nuclei may also be showing the same tetrahedral shapes, which is why we see the same magic numbers. And then as you expand on that, that's why molecules tend to form these types of structures as well, either forming linear, triangular, that's 1D and 2D, or when it's 3D, typically a tetrahedral type structure. So it happens throughout nature, and that's one way of possibly explaining uh, those numbers and the geometries that you saw in the previous slide. Now there's a lot more that I won't cover today from energy wave theory, just scratch the surface, but uh, using the same principle, uh, again began by Wolf and Lafreniere, where it's uh, waves, standing waves of energy for these particles, but traveling waves uh, then determine the forces. So the electric, magnetic, and gravitational and strong forces were derived and calculated, and much more that I won't list here from the photon energies to atomic orbital distances. The important thing is because it comes from and simplified to five uh, constants, the ones that were shown earlier for amplitude and wavelength and, and density. And so to compare this then to the standard model, the EWT model is very simple. There's only three spatial dimensions from a one elementary particle, possibly the neutrino, one principal cause of motion, which is traveling waves, and it's a difference in wave amplitude. And if you compare that to the standard model, there's 10 or 11 spatial dimensions, depending on the, on the theory. The model does have 17 elementary particles, and there are four principal causes of motion. 
but this really tells it all. Right? From a simple equation that started like this for the EWT model, forces and energy and particles uh, can be explained. You can compare that to the standard model equation on the right, uh, and it's, it's quite complex. And that's it. I mean, this is the case, really trying to build the case that the universe is simple. It's man that has made it complex. And if I think we dig into the details about uh, a wave structure of these particles, I think it opens a new possibility for, for physics uh, and really hopefully for products uh, and technology that can be built from that science. Thank you.